So how does it feel to be in the studio 25 plus years later now? And hearing this new music that you put out on Tradition Lives, you're back at the Grand Ole Opry playing it live for the people. Now you got to go out and do some of the hits. They're not going to be satisfied. And, and then you put some of the new stuff on them. What kind of response? You just, uh, as we sit here in the last few hours, uh, you had a, an autograph signing that you said went on well into the night after the Opry. We have those mm-hmm. signings in the Opry shop, and that went great. It's it's. Real exciting, man. I gotta tell you. How long has it been between albums? It's been, um, I know it's been at least eight years since I've had an album with all new, with original songs. And um, I'm just really tickled about it. I'm really excited and and fired up about it because um, I've wanted for so long to have some new songs. I've had uh, fans come out on the road. Now, we've never stopped. You know, we've never slowed down. We've been on the road nonstop since, like like I said earlier, since since 90. And um, people always say at the meet and greets and uh, autograph sessions afterwards, people say, when are we going to get any, some new music from you? Uh-huh. Anything new? Anything new coming up? You know, we want some new songs. And so I would just say, well, we're, as soon as I can figure out a way to make that happen. And thank God for Jimmy Ritchie, you know, who who got this uh, new label up and running. And He uh, produced the record, too. Produced it. Yeah. And so we got in there, and uh, he said, take all the time you need, and that's what I did. And How much time was that? Uh, <laughs> almost three years. <laughs> Well, it, it it came out the way I wanted it. Did he ever put his arm around his neck and go, Mark, when I said take all the time you no. need? I didn't mean all the time you need. No, he never <laughs> Almost did. all the time you he need. He never did. He really well, that's did. great. He, he said, I don't care how long it takes. We, <laughs> we want this thing to be the best that we've ever done, that you've ever done. So I, I did take my time. And, and like I told you, I had some problems with my voice going in earlier and then uh, – and scheduling, you know, me being on the road all the time and not being able to get in the studio. Then I'd come into the studio and try to try to do the vocals on this thing, and, and I would be hoarse because I was on the road for four or five nights in a row Yeah. before I went to the studio. So it, it we had to really take our time and make sure I was well-rested and things were right. And, you know, these microphones, they don't lie in the studio. And I didn't want to do any auto tuning or anything like that. I wanted it to sound real. I want it to sound like an old, like a real record. I didn't want it to sound dated, but I want it to sound modern, new. But uh, I, I didn't want it to. I wanted it to have all the the soul and the 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 warmth of of tape. And so that's what we went for. But um, you know, hearing it now and and. It just it makes me so excited because now people are listening to this and they're finally getting what they've asked for all these years and I can't believe the response. You know, we're we're doing right now we're doing only two of the new songs. We're doing uh Auto Miss Me by Now and Hot. And uh this coming weekend we're gonna go out and we're gonna we're we're, we're gonna do a quarter in my pocket. <laughs> We're going to start eventually working wow. all these songs. The entire album we're going to work into our set. So we might have a three-and-a-half-hour, four-hour set <laughs> because all these songs I want to sing live, they're, they're so good. I'm so proud of them. I want I want everybody to hear it. I, I think it's the best work I've ever done. And all the guys that, that played on this session, they were saying, man, it's so, it's so good. You know, like guys like Brent Mason, it's so good to finally play the music that we came to town to play in the first place. And we haven't been able to do much of this kind of music. And in the time you've been here, what's ironic is a generation of country fans, men and women, young men and women have come along, that don't know this as the mainstream. Yeah. That this is something they've heard about because, with all due respect to bro country, that has been where the sales and the popularity and the stadium yeah. shows has been for the male artists, with the exception of maybe Kenny Chesney, with as far as style, because that whole 
that's a lifestyle as much as mm-hmm. it is a music style with Kenny. Well, this too. is too. And what, what I it do is. is a lifestyle. It's it's country music. It's the kind of music that I grew up singing. That when I start, I was singing this this type of music when I was sixteen years old. Yeah, in, in the honky tonks well, in Beaumont. And then I think about the women in country music and the ranging vocals and the performances that lean toward the pop side that they do so extraordinarily well. But again, that traditional country music that you hear when you put this CD in, Tradition Lives, and the first thing you hear, and, and you referenced the song earlier, you're going to add it to your set out on the road, is I got a quarter in my pocket, and it's an old cold intro. You just start right off the bat. Mm-hmm. And something magic happens inside of you. I can't explain it. It's the way music touches us all. But I can't believe anybody would hear the opening cut on this album and go, uh, if they never knew you, didn't know a thing about traditional country music, but heard that song, if that was their introduction, that they wouldn't say, I got to know more about this and where it came from. There's got to be more where this came from. And obviously there there are what 12 you got a bonus track on this cd yeah. too yeah there's a, there's 13 all together and uh, 12 new studio tracks and and so that's uh and it's all country man there's there's no doubt about it there's no um there's no hip hop country rapping or singing about uh, you know daisy dukes dancing on the tailgate around a bonfire at the river at night and well all this guy wants to know in the opening of the song is what to do with his quarter does he put it in the jukebox and play yeah, another country uh, it's, song it's basic country and music weep is... and moan or does he put it in the phone and call his baby yeah that's simple it's that simple <laughs> this is this album is country music it's it's real country music and it's it's uh we didn't set out and say hey let's let's uh make a statement here and and do an album that's country music because I've been doing this kind of album for years. It just so happens that for some reason right now people are interested in it again. You know, you know, for years I've done um, several albums like, uh, you know, several years ago I did um, Saving the Honky Tonks. Um, you know, I did uh, the Rolling with the Flow album. All those albums were country, mm-hmm. just as country as this one. All of them had fiddle and steel, and uh, now all of a sudden, it's like I've done something new. <laughs> it's just something I've always done. I just think the timing was right, and the songs are so strong. I, that's one thing. They're all great I, I songs. was just looking as you sit here and talk, because that's one of the things I wanted to touch on with your writers, people, uh, names that just jump off the page uh, that are successful modern day writers, where you got Billy Yates, Jared Neiman, Randy Hauser, Jamie Johnson, uh, Tim Menzies, been around for a long time. He would have been getting started. Actually, he had an artist I career a, about the time you. I cut you a whole young. lot of Tim Menzies songs over the years. Uh, Brett Eldridge, but then there's Curly Putman's name. Yeah. Who's a songwriter, Hall of Famer, and was here when this thing that you and I know and love as country when music. I was that you're trying to get back to kid. with this album. Yeah. <laughs> He was the guy with Dallas Frazier and Whitey Schaefer. Yeah. They were the ones writing these songs. Red Lane, mm-hmm. who w- winds up with a cut, posthumously, obviously. And yeah. um, Actually, I cut that song while he was still alive. Oh, did you really? Yeah, I did. I, I, it was not meant to be a tribute song to Red or Merle. And it's called There'll Never Be Another Now. Yeah, I There Won't Be Another it. Now. It was. Um, this, is, this was a song that Jimmy and I recorded at his house one night. He says like two in the morning or something. Two or three or four in the morning. I don't know. We used to go over. The, I used to go over there and hang out and just brainstorm. Just try to uh-huh. try to write songs and try to figure out what we were going to record next. What we were going to do for next for another project. And I didn't have a record deal or anything. We just wanted to record. And so one night we heard this song. We were listening to old Merle songs and. Uh, and I, I've always loved that song since I was a kid, since I was since the seventies when it was first recorded. Uh, but I never sang it, never, not one time have I ever tried to sing this song. And so um, that night, oh, so I got, oh yeah, I got to tell you too. Like I, I said, I did not tell you earlier that Merle Haggard told me I should record that song because I told him I love that song so much. And and he said, how long yeah. ago was that? He said this was. Or in the early 2000s. Okay. And he said, uh, 
Merle said, oh, it's a Red Lane song. He said, you should you should cut that song someday. I said, yeah, maybe I will. I hope I can sometime. It's just you and a guitar. Man. And so that night at, at Jimmy's house, Jimmy said, well, let's, let's go upstairs and lay that down. Let's put that on tape, see what it sounds like, just for us, just for the hell of it. So that's what we did. He, he pulled a guitar off the wall, tuned it up, and he – hit record on the machine and there we went and uh, he played the guitar and i sang it and one time through and that was it we said well, well all right this is cool so we had something for us it was just for us to have and we played it for our friends and my band played it for them all the time and then uh and then when red was sick we um we were out on the road and i played it for uh kirk roth sells merchandise for me now on the road and he is also a great songwriter and he wrote a lot with uh with red and hank cochran and we about got the next album wrote anyway by the way just just letting you know that we and kirk's been working on it but anyway he um <laughs> so you won't have to wait how many years there won't eight be years? eight years there won't no. be eight years hopefully, between albums hopefully between it won't be. this one tradition lives but we Mark he, Chestnut. he uh but red lane was sick <laughs> and uh susie cochran hank uh, hank's widow was taking care of red and, and uh I played it for Kirk one day, and he said, "Oh man, let me play this. Let me." He said, "All right, if I email this to Susie." And uh, so uh, he he did. He, he emailed it and uh, played it for played it for Red. And then she called, and I got to talk to Red while I think it was just a couple of days before he passed away. Oh. So he got to hear it, and um, well, how but Merle is... never did. Merle never got to hear my oh, version wow. of the song because he passed away this year and then so we had a song already cut and i told jimmy he said why don't we just put that on there as a bonus track and and uh dedicate it to merle and red in fact you got to play it for red and the line is a song as there may be another morning but there will be another never be another now yeah that works That's, perfect for both of them wow. right yeah well, we've talked about the first thing on the album, which is I got a quarter in my pocket, and now we've, we've talked about a bonus track that people are going to go searching for. It's a tribute to Red Lane and Hank Cochran and Merle Haggard and George Jones and all those great heroes of yours. Let's talk about that music in between. Well, it's in the middle. Yeah, because <laughs> one of the, the, the next things that comes is, is it still cheating if we're both lying? Does it get any more country <laughs> than that? And your writers are Jamie Johnson, Randy Hauser, Jared Neiman, the trio of great not only are they great performers i think people overlook how talented they are as songwriters yeah they are great songwriters and i didn't know they were they wrote that song i knew that that jamie wrote it because he, he'd brought it to me several years back mm -hmm. when i was working on another album and he he thought it would be a great uh duet he he thought it would be good for me and leanne womack to do together Woo. And yeah. I don't know at the time somehow or another I was on a I was on another label and they didn't they I like like you always hear they the label thought it was too country so we said so I just put it aside I said I'll cut it one of these days and so I was not hesitant whatsoever but that song was written a long time ago a lot of these songs mm. were written way back. Well, tell me about the one that we're working. I guess if there's a single off this album, yeah, uh, ought to miss me by now. Yeah, there is a single, ought to miss me by now. I don't know. We've heard you do it on the opera already. Yeah, we, a couple we've of been playing it. Our we've been we do it live, and people already know it because they're hearing it. You know, they they people have downloaded the the album. It's a rangy song. And, for you. Oh man, it's high. It, yeah. it gets way up there, <laughs> and so when we do it in our show. It's way down there at the bottom of the set at towards the end of the show. And last night was the first time I I did it at the Opry. Well, I had three songs, that's it. So it was I did uh It's a little too late, one of the old songs. And then I did Ought to Miss Ought Me to miss By me Now. Down. Well, I wasn't warmed up enough 
Oh, man, I was up there pushing and struggling, trying to hit them high notes. <laughs> I got them, though, boy. I hit every one of them, but, ooh, I paid for it, man. It wore me out when I got – and then afterward, after that, we did uh, another song on the album called Hot. Oh, Don Poitras, Win Varble. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's that song's been around song. for a decade it, it, or more. It has. And it's been one of those writer night's favorites when yeah. either one of them or both of them are on stage. Yeah. And it is just perfect because, as you and I sit here, it's midsummer 2016. Hot and humidity is Louisiana humidity right now in Nashville, which we uh -huh. have a blast of that every year in the summertime. Yeah. And I'm and it, right now. And it couldn't it have been a better night to come out and do it on well, the opera. I'm telling you, man. It, you know, that's it's like that all the time where I live. And and um, I just uh, I had never heard the song. I didn't know it was old, and the first time I heard the demo, I thought, I am going to cut that. I've got to cut that. It's perfect. <laughs> and um, so it, so that's one of my favorite songs to play live. I just love it because it's so true. Ain't it funny how I started off with a, my career started with a song about being hot, you know, about the weather, yeah. and now 26 years later I've got another song about, <laughs> about hot. I think about all my old flames have new names and how, how funny and yet poignant that song was, yeah. how clever it was, fast moving it was. And you've got another one of those on this album, Tradition Lives, called Neither Did I. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's and that's one that your old friend Tim Menzies is a, yeah, is a part of. Yeah, there's a couple of those kind of songs on this album. Monty Criswell's on it, uh, uh, writer, uh, writer credit on it. Yeah, it, it's a. Uh, Oh, it's a great song. I, I yeah. loved it when I heard it. And, and uh, anything that Tim Menzies sends me, I keep it because I like to hear him sing. I love his voice. Yeah. And, and every even if I don't record the song, I keep the demo because I just love to hear him. I love his voice. But I heard that the first time. I said, oh, yeah, 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 that's me. I got to do that. And and I'm really proud of everybody. That's the next one on the list. We're going to start doing Quarter My Pocket, and then we're going to do Neither Did I. And we're just going to, like we're I said, on the same page, we're going to do we? the whole huh? album. <laughs> How'd you come up with Tradition Lives for the title? Because there's not a song by that name on here. Well, you know, but when we, um, it pretty much sums up what it's all about. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely does. We, yeah. um, we started using Tradition Lives on a t shirt a couple of years ago. It was uh, because everybody always talks about how we do we do real country music in our shows. Uh, you come to our shows, you're not going to see a bunch of guys trying to play rock and roll. You're going to get see guys a real seven piece country honky tonk band with uh -huh. fiddle and steel, authentic, yeah. playing real country music, and so. Basically, it's like we're keeping a tradition alive. And somebody came up with the idea of tradition lives for a shirt. And it was a cool idea, and then it looked good on the shirt, looked great on the hats. And so when we we started working on this album, we were thinking, well, what are we going to call it? Jimmy and I were talking, what are we going to call this thing? And then one of us said, I don't remember who it was, well, why don't we just call it Tradition Lives? Because it, it really says a lot about this record. And it caught on. And I think oh, that's man. what gets a lot of attention is just the title yeah. before they even hear the songs. When did you realize you were famous back in those early days in 1990? Oh, when, back in those days. When, when, oh, uh, okay. And how did you deal with that? I thought I was famous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you were. Let's put Trust it me. that way. Don't be modest. You Let's, were. No, I'm not being but, but I'm what, telling you. At what point did you realize, wait a minute, this thing is taking off I with thought me or I was without more, me? I, I better... thought I was more famous than I was. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, I, I went through that, that period that uh, <laughs> what we all go through in this business. Uh, well, I've I've got it made. I'm famous. I'm big time. And... and uh, you know the head swells up a little bit. You get your hat size gets a little bigger, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, that lasted about as about as long as it took for me to get home. And then my wife straightened that up real quick. 
<laughs> I got to believe she said staying you, in Beaumont, though, going it, back it, home, that keep, has keeps a, you grounded. You that, can't that, pull that stuff on your family. Everything to do with it. That's, that's that, that had everything to do with it. And I come home with that with an attitude. My wife said, you can leave that star stuff outside. That's not exactly what she said. She, she said, <laughs> that you, leave, on the all bus, that, on the you leave all that outside when you come home. And my friends were basically the same way. You know, when you when you <laughs> live when you live in the area you grew up in, you spent your entire life in, and you've still got the same friends that you had before anything ever started. You still got your your family there. They're not gonna treat you different. They never have and they kept me grounded. And I thank God for them every day that, that nobody ever treated me different. And that's why I stayed there. I, I stayed grounded, and I think that had more to do. It still has more to do with me being who I am and playing my kind of music than anything else. It's because uh, I stayed home. I, I know where my roots are, and I'm still hooked to them. My career has paralleled your career in a lot of ways. My years yeah. in South Texas, and then I came to Nashville. You came in 90 with your first record. I got here in 1994. And as I think about that two-plus decades that our careers have paralleled, one of the most significant things that you and I share is the day George Jones passed away, Yeah, you had just walked in the door and sat down in the studio to do an interview with me. Yeah. And as well as we've known each other through the years, as many memories as we've shared, as many records of yours as I've played, as many times that we've done this along the way over 20 plus, 25 plus years now, that will always ring as the moment in time that I saw something in Mark Chestnut that I'd never seen before. You were able to, even though you broke down, to show emotion in a way I didn't know you were capable of, to be honest with you, but it... <laughs> took you by surprise, and obviously touched you as deeply as anything you've ever experienced in your life, the death of George Jones that day. Yeah. What, do you, what do you recall about that friendship with him, about learning about it that day, and things he taught you that you still use? George, well, first off, I got to tell you, George Jones and I met for the first time in about 80, probably 83, I think it was. I was playing in a band wasn't my band. I was playing in a band that uh, somehow or another worked their way into Jones Country, his music park out there in in, uh, in Comus, Neal, Texas. And uh, that's where he went when he straightened out and got off all the bad stuff and, and married Nancy. And they opened up a big outdoor music park, and so he wouldn't have to travel the road anymore. And... So somehow or another, I got in a band that got the opening spot. So I opened up every single show at Jones Country that, that ever went on. And so I got to meet George and his band, and I became close friends with all of them. And George would let me go on stage and sing with his band during his show. He would mm. call me up. Man. And we hit it off because I was from Beaumont. He was from the Beaumont area. You know, grew up in Beaumont. My daddy ran around with him when they were young in the 50s and 60s around Beaumont. And so he was always real nice to me. And and then when daddy passed away, right after Too Cold at Home came out and became a big hit, my daddy passed away. And uh, George knew how close we were, me and my daddy. And he told me, he called me the next day after my dad passed away and he said uh, he said well son I, I'm just here to tell you that um, I'll never take nobody's ever going to take the place of your dad he said but you're just getting started in this business and it can get crazy and I want to let you know I'm here for you if you ever need me if you ever need to talk to somebody that'll be that'll shoot straight with you if you want to talk ask any questions if you get confused frustrated and you will he said just uh, you can always trust me and i won't ever lie to you or, or steer you wrong and uh 
I'm here for you. Just if you need some somebody to talk to. He said, because I know you can't trust very many people in this business, but I, he said, I promise you, you can trust me. And so that was that was it. That was the ultimate bond there. And we shared that bond till the day he died. And that's why I broke down the way I did. I mean, we, we worked together. We toured together for years, all through the 90s. Well, we he recorded became that together. that father figure for He was you. my mentor. Yeah, yeah. And he was, he was, in a way, my, uh, my father figure he mm-hmm. you know he was there and, and to help me and and he did call me several times when i got out there on the road and acted stupid <laughs> and when i needed to talk to somebody i talked i called george how recently had you talked to him before he passed away oh it had been several months yeah i had uh, the last time i sang with him was uh just uh several months before he passed away i, I can't even tell you how many but uh hmm. He, he wasn't really feeling good. He wasn't even playing the guitar anymore on stage, and he was out there working still. And I, we were on the same show. And um, after my show, he uh, sent somebody down to tell me. They said, uh, George wants you to come up and sing yesterday's wine with him if if it's all right if you want to i said oh hell yeah i'd love to sing with george again (laughs) so i went up there and and i did merle haggard's part to yesterday's wine the duet they recorded years ago and and uh and then we did me and jesus you know got our own thing going tom t hall right there yep i thought so. and we sang that was the last two songs we sang together and we had sang thousands of songs together just sitting around on the bus and cutting up and recorded together and all the times that we worked together and then that's why you know it hit me so hard oh, that I, that i will never forget that, that rock that i leaned on for I, all those years was gone i treasure that moment and i actually for the first time in my life i felt totally alone that day since that merle haggard has passed away yeah, that and was you just right. referenced him. So, uh, what kind of friendship? When we talk about tradition, lives you are the tradition. Those traditions that came before have been passed on and passed down, if you will, and well, you'll pass it on to someone else. You know, they you're both. The, you're the torchbearer for a time, <laughs> I guess, aren't you? Are you start to feel that way at this I stage don't of your know life. I know about that, but I, I will say that George Jones, Merle Haggard, and Waylon Jennings all told me. That um, if I kept doing what I'm doing, staying true to who I really am, don't ever change, no matter what. They said it's gonna be tough, but you stay. They all three told me this. It's amazing how they told me this at different times. And they said, "Is if you stay who you are, you'll work as long as you want to in this business." And that's the one thing that all three of them have in common to me because they all told me that same thing. And so, I mean, that's like the gods telling you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know there's only one God, but that, but it's like he's, but God, in Greek mythology, God if, sent these guys here to If teach there was me. a country version of Greek yeah. mythology, they would be the gods, wouldn't they? I'm telling you, and that's, that's just the way it worked out for me, and I feel so blessed to be able to hang around these guys. You know, Merle Haggard asked, invited us out to his house one time. I was on tour with Tracy Lawrence and Joe Diffie in the early 2000s, and we had a night off, and we were up in Redding, California, and um, he, his somebody from his organization called my publicist and, and uh, said that uh, Merle invited us out to the house. We wanted to go, so um, they gave me a number to call. I called and I talked to somebody, and they gave me that, the address how to get there and directions. You know, it was, it was before everybody had the maps. The on GPS, their phone. yeah. So. I rented a van, and, and Joe and Tracy and me, we loaded up, and there we went. You know, stopped and got <laughs> us a cooler full of beer and <laughs> went out to Merle Haggard's ranch, and we sat down and had lunch with him and talked to him for a long time, and then we went out 
to the studio next door to his house and his band was there and they were rehearsing to go out on the road he sat out on the couch with a guitar and, and and his wife sat next to him and we got a three-hour concert and they played he would call off the song he would tell us how he wrote it or who wrote it and what it was about or how he came to write a song i mean old songs too and they would play the songs and then we'd talk some more and then and then we'd take a break and go outside and talk for a little while. And it was just one of those great memories. That's the day Merle told me I should record There Won't Be Another Now. Wow. Mark Chestnut, Tradition Lives, available wherever you buy or download music. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. This has been special. Always is. There won't be another now. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there'll be a next time. <laughs> there will be. Thank you, pal. Hi, this is Bill Cody from 650 AM WSM. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. If you like what you've seen, click the button below.